Hi, it's been a great pleasure to be here on this occasion. I happen to be the first student of Paddy, uh, 83 to 89. And uh, um, it has been, a, it had been a very great pleasure to be his student. And uh, it is always like a friend. And uh, one other thing which he has taught me is to enjoy physics and just not be a, uh, take physics as a profession. And that has helped me in diversifying later after PhD. Um, in fact, uh, about enjoying physics, and I remember one incident in the East Canteen in TIFR. Uh, we used to talk about a lot of things once we were talking about history. So he asked me, Sesh, do you like history? Now, Paddy asking, do you like history? I wanted to be very careful about answering. I said, I didn't, don't like the history the way it was taught to me in school. Then he asked me, did you like physics the way it was taught to you in school? <laughs> and, oh, then why, did you, <laughs> why do you like physics? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I will be talking on is again one of the examples of Paddy's training because of which I could diversify into other subjects. My work was on inflation in PhD, but now I have been working on other things. But in this particular work, I have, uh, I have I'll be talking on generation of cosmic magnetic fields uh, in the early universe in the context of some inflationary scenarios. The uh, so the magnetic fields have been observed at uh, various scales, um, the order of micro gauss nearby galaxies. They have also been observed in galaxies at redshifts of something like z to or uh, z equal to 1.2. Now, when you see magnetic field at a, a high redshift like this, the problem comes up that you know to see these magnetic fields, uh, suppose they were generated at some time before that there is not enough time from generation to this redshift for magnetic fields uh, to have amplified. So you need a very efficient mechanism to amplify magnetic field from an earlier time when the seeds were produced till this time when they were observed of this level. And uh, that uh, uh, prompts us to see if these magnetic fields are primordial in origin. So, uh, so uh, uh, so one of the um, one of the routes one takes is to look for generation of magnetic fields in the early universe, and uh, uh, so this is the uh, line which I will be uh, taking in this talk. Now, in the framework of standard electromagnetic action, uh, one cannot generate magnetic fields, and uh, that is because of the conformal invariance of the electromagnetic action. So one will have to look at some non-standard scenarios to do this. Now, the work discussed here has been in collaboration with uh, Kandu and uh, Atmajit and uh, also with Isha, who is also here. So in the standard electromagnetic action, I mean, we start with this uh, robertson ocker metric. And in the standard electromagnetic action, we, ha we have the action of this form. Now, as I said, this action is conformally invariant. So that is GMU nu going to omega squared dm g mu nu. The form of the action and the form of the Maxwell's equations remains invariant. So in this situation, electromagnetic field fluctuations uh, cannot be amplified in a homogeneous isotropic uh, flat universe. So if suppose I have, so the, uh, the magnetic field B will go as 1 by a square, where a is the scale factor. And so if you take a square into b, which is like the total flux, because a is a length scale and a square is like area. So a square into b is a total flux. And that total flux uh, remains constant with expansion. And so in order to generate magnetic fields, uh, one would, uh, in this mechanism, one would uh, have to break the conformal invariance for this purpose. Now, so what one does is usually to uh, do this, one modifies the electromagnetic action. And one of the simplest way to do it is to have a coefficient of f mu nu, f mu nu, which is a small f, which evolves with time. Now, this f is equal to 1 in the standard scenario, or constant in the standard scenario. Now, the question is in the, usually this f, uh, 
is put as is put uh, rather arbitrarily. It may depend on a field, which may depend on an inflaton, which may be an inflaton field or something. Uh, but uh, we will be looking at uh, a possible natural way in which we can get this f. Now there are of course some problems with this, which I would uh, say in the beginning. One is the back reaction problem. One is the, uh, that is, in the process of generating fields, we should not produce too much fields that it back reacts on the cosmology. The other is called the strong coupling problem because with this, there is the other piece, which is the interaction with charged particles. So if I have an F into this, we can take this F out and the effective charge happens to be E by F if I take it out. And so when F, if is small, the charge, the effective charge coupling becomes very large and that is called the strong coupling problem. Well, this was one thing which uh, again come do myself and some students are working on, but we have not yet been able to complete it. Otherwise I was planning to give that here. So, um, so the other thing is after doing this, we need to recover the Maxwell's equations after this whole drama is over. And, uh, we, and we, we try to get an invariant spectrum for the magnetic field. Now the question is, as I was mentioning, is there a natural way of getting a factor like F? And the answer is yes, and we do this by appealing to a higher dimensional cosmology. So in this, we consider a universe with d extra dimensions, d extra spatial dimensions in addition to the one plus three dimension. Now what we assume is that in this, the normal spatial sector is homogeneous and isotropic. The higher dimensional spatial uh, sector is also, higher is also homogeneous and isotropic. However, the scale factor for the normal dimension and the scale factor of the higher dimension is different. So we have, this is the T, this is the uh, normal dimensional sector with A as a scale factor. This is the higher dimensional sector with B as a scale factor. And we use an action in the higher dimension with a gauss bonnet like term put in here. And this L tilde and uh, L, uh, all these L tildes are all the higher dimensional Lagrangian. This L tilde EM is defined the way it is done in four dimensions, but with uh, the vector field and the spatial field with, uh, with uh, one plus three plus D dimensions. And we have the R again is one plus three plus D dimensional Ricky tensor, Ricky scalar, and chi is a Gauss Bonnet parameter, which we had put it here. And now we uh, we take this Lagrangian and we do a dimensional reduction. And by dimensional reduction, we uh, get to a one plus three dimensional effective electromagnetic action. Now, when we do this, what happens is that if this is the effective electromagnetic action given by, by and the relationship between L and the higher dimensional Lagrangian uh, is this. Then this, this, this portion uh, has a factor which is B by B naught. Uh, remember that B is the higher dimensional scale factor which is evolving with time. So this plays the role of uh, the F which was here. So the higher dimensional scale factor by this dimensional reduction from the higher dimension naturally gives me a mechanism to uh, break the conformal invariance in four dimension. Why do you use Gauss Bonnet instead of that? Because I started with a... Yes, that doesn't work. So we use Gauss Bonnet, in, then we are able to produce... Uh, the required scale. The required, uh, yeah. So we actually originally... Uh, this has been tried by other people also, and uh, then we had uh, introduced it. Okay, so now once we have this action in four dimension, we can now write the generalized Maxwell's equation. I call it generalized because it is no more, this is no more a constant. We write the generalized <coughs> <coughs> action and uh, we get this. And at the end of it, if we just reduce it further, this is the equation we get for the vector field. So now here, what we find is that suppose uh, B was a constant or it was absent, this term will be absent and you have the standard uh, wave equation for, uh, for, oh, again this has happened. I thought, uh, uh -huh. I mean it had also been made not to sleep for three hours, okay.
So Narasimha was not, not your uh, dark matter which did it. <laughs> Even magnetic field, right? <laughs> equally harmful. That's what you mean. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Where was I? Huh. It has come a long way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have this equation and then, uh, no. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the existence of this extra dimensional scale factor is basically to introduce this term. Now, one can see that, you know, this term is something like for a simple harmonic oscillator, this is like a damping term if B prime is positive. Okay. Or can be an amplifying term if B prime is negative. Okay, so uh, this this could lead uh, this could produce this would give a possible uh, mechanism for magnetogenesis. Now, the key uh, feature of the solution for this whole thing is that first of all, in this scenario, one is able to get a scale factors uh, a and b, which have the following property: that in the initial stage, for a very small time, there are some transients. And very, very, very soon, it settles down to exponential uh, expansion. Now, I am not committing myself here whether alpha and beta are positive or negative at this point. Okay, so it could be deflationary, it could be inflationary. One, okay. Oh, sorry, a of t should be, but okay. What I mean is this one. I am not. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Now, in uh, we had actually tried this. There were some. We could not achieve what we needed, so we, we had tried out by putting a cosmological constant type term in the higher dimensional action and then working this out. And then what we get is that we get a variety of solutions, this is just to illustrate. That so for various values of d, we calculated a, b, and uh, for lambda prime equal to zero, and then for various values of lambda prime also, we Calculated the uh, a prime and the magnetic field power spectrum. Pardon? No, no, no. So these are all possible solutions which exist when you just solve the equation. Okay. So I mean, the, uh, the, so we will we will choose which are the acceptable ones. Okay. Okay. So now. Uh, let us look at the evolution of the scale factor in this scenario. So here, this prime which is there is uh, denotes conformal time. Here, I should mention that when I say conformal time, I am using the scale the scale factor of the normal dimension to define the conformal time because there are two scale factors here. Okay. So this is the uh, so I can uh, so this script A is related to uh, the scale factor A times the vector potential, and one can write the evolution of script A in this form. Because the script A is the one which will ultimately be used in calculating the magnetic power spectrum. Now here we find that there is this k square piece and this piece, and clearly, if suppose this term is negative, then we have growing solutions for script A. If uh, this bracket term, so if suppose this portion is greater than uh, k square, we'll have that. Now using this, using the form of scale factor which we had mentioned. We can define this. This, uh, this is for the the uh, the, uh, ex the index for the expansion of the higher dimensional scale factor, and this is for the normal dimensional scale factor. We define this quantity xi, and putting all this into this, we can write this in this form, where we have k square minus xi xi minus one by eta square. Okay, and the same as this, just written it different way. So with this, we can then calculate the power spectrum for the magnetic field. And this is what I said, the power spectrum of the magnetic field depends on the mod square of script A. That's why we had converted that into that equation. There is another uh, thing which is here, that while we are generating magnetic field, we are also generating electric field. And while we need uh, the required strength of the magnetic field, we have to make sure that the electric field does not grow. Uh, I mean, does not grow because, uh, yeah. Okay, so if we work out all this in this scenario, the, what we conclude is the following, that first of all, we have a background cosmology which gives exponential behavior scale factor. 
Now, for scale invariant power spectrum of magnetic field, there are two cases where this is possible. One is this xi which I had defined here, okay? This xi is uh, either 3 or is minus 2. Now, when it is, so I will just point out the problems also here. When xi is equal to 3, this is not an acceptable solution because as we, uh, as I said, uh, when you calculate the electric field power spectrum, that's, that grows rapidly in this case. However, when I have <coughs> uh, xi equal to minus 2, then one is able to achieve uh, acceptable, uh, then the scenario becomes acceptable if we take the extra dimension to be 4 and we include a parameter which is a cosmological parameter like term in the higher dimension. And when you have lambda prime in this range, then the magnetic field strength turns out to be between 10 to the power minus 10 and 10 to the power minus 7 uh, Gauss. Now, here there is of course a downside. So, if you look at uh, xi, the form of xi is d by 2 minus beta by alpha. So, if xi is negative, it means that both beta and alpha have the same sign. And since alpha has to be positive, beta has to be positive, which is a bad aspect of this thing, which it says that the not only the, uh, the normal dimension, the extra dimension is also growing during inflation. Now, this is something which we have tried to sort of address and see uh, how we can uh, take care of this one, but as yet we have not been able to do that. So, this is the downside of this uh, approach. Now, one can actually do one more thing is that this magnetic the field which we have considered are all uh, non-helical magnetic field. Now, what can happen is we can uh, add a helical term. Now, what happens in the, in the uh, normal four-dimensional case, uh, if you have a term of, the, of uh, this kind, that is f mu nu, f mu nu prime, then such a thing becomes a surface term which can be integrated out. Now, in higher dimension, that is not the case. So now what we do is we consider the higher dimensional scenario and we include a helical term in the higher dimension. And as of now, we have put two parameters L and F bar over here. And I mean, this is just um, because since the higher dimensional thing, uh, I have just defined how you define the dual for this uh, uh, F mu nu. And on dimension reduction, again, as before, we get this action, but now this LEM includes this F mu nu term plus the uh, F mu nu, F mu nu star term. But now, this does, is no more a surface term because this whole thing is being multiplied by, by a time dependent factor, which is b to power d, okay? Now, here, in the, so if you reduce it to one plus three dimension electromagnetic action, again, there is no conformal invariance, even if you take L and F to be constants. So, we again go through the same thing. We write the uh, generalized Maxwell's equation and we come to this one. As you see, these three terms are exactly what they were in the previous case, in the non-helical case, and this is the extra piece which comes because of the helical thing. So, then we uh, Fourier transform the uh, electromagnetic field and uh, we can write the helical part and the non-helical part for this h equal to plus for uh, plus for positive helicity and minus for negative helicity and we go through this whole thing and then again we have this this is the uh, equation for the script a corresponding to the one which we had in the non helical case and this v of h is here and again as we see this portion is the same as we had before because uh, i said that xi is minus beta by d so it is xi, xi minus 1 by eta square, which is there. But then again, the, uh, the uh, helical part introduces this extra term. And then we calculate the power spectrum. Now here, the power spectrum will be contributed by both the positive helicity term and the negative helicity term. And this is the total power spectrum. Yes, I'm coming to that, yeah. So, uh, so here, we have given how the vector potential evolves. So you see that the the uh, the uh, the uh, positive uh, helicity term increases, whereas the negative helicity term decreases, which means there's a net helicity at the end of it in this scenario. And the, here we find that for appropriate choice of parameters, that is 
uh, uh, that is uh, beta d is one equal to two, and uh, the again four dimension, we have a flat power spectrum in this case. Okay. So, so again here we have we have considered an action with a parity breaking term, and uh, as we see, mode of, modes of one helicity dominates over the other, and there are some cases where you can get a scale invariant power spectrum. And for a scale invariant case, we are able to get magnetic field of strength 10 to the power minus 9 Gauss for an H which is above, which is 10 to the power minus 3 times the Planck mass. And if we consider, I mean, if we consider uh, you know, the uh, uh, energy scales for inflation to be lower, then the fields produced are weaker. And as this, this is sort of in agreement with the kind of observations, but I would again repeat that in this, uh, uh, the helical thing also, the problem still remains that both beta as well as alpha, both are positive and we as yet do not have a mechanism to make one deflationary, the other is inflationary. Thanks. We have been asked to ask people to use the mic. Okay. It's very important. <laughs> Could you uh, say a word about gauge invariance to equations? Uh, yes, we have. Oh, uh, yes, they were gauge. I mean, we have we have chosen a particular gauge in this. I mean, uh, the uh, yeah. I mean, this is the uh, 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 del i ai is zero and. Uh, uh, a a zero is zero. So that's what we have used in this equation. And the components which the higher dimensional components of a mu's they have been made zero. Yeah. But now, um, but all the original equations that you wrote down, gauge invariant. Yes. They are. Yeah. 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 That we haven't shown. I thought that was the third charge that you were having those charges growing. No. Oh. Uh, no. You see, what happens is. Uh, okay, it is, uh, see the, this E is there, but the, it's just a coefficient of A mu J, I mean, A, I mean, whatever, the coefficient that is E gets divided by that F. So I do not know, I mean, the, the effect in the equations of motion is like that of the charge going, but I do not know if it affects the gauge invariance. I don't think it affects the gauge invariance. That surprises me. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, I can check, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay. What is the need for having a scale invariant power spectrum for the magnetic field? There is no real constraint. Uh, yeah, okay. I would say that I mean it's similar to you know the Harrison Zeldovich spectrum. We need. I mean, we don't want suppose the power law, then we don't want uh, one end of the spectrum to blow open. And if it is not a power law, then where is the scale coming from? Where the change in behavior? That's what I was saying, yeah. 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 If it's a pure power law. And it's not a pure power law, then the question arises, where is the scale yeah. which changes the power law? No, no, I think uh, CMB has strong constraints for blue spectra. Um, the large scale structure thing will have strong constraints for the red spectra. So unless you keep changing the shape, unless you have adjust the shape, so that you satisfy all these constraints. Or the strength is so weak that it doesn't matter and just provides a seed. You probably need to. Then you are the happy problem is it. about amplification, right? If it's too small a seed. No, no. Okay, that is uh, your problem, not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I I have a question. Maybe I misunderstood you, but uh, why you assume D is equal to four? That's the number of extra dimensions, oh, right? Oh, I okay. We have tried it for various Ds. For D equal to four, we get the required thing. That's what what, is, what is the required thing that you get the invariant spectrum? Invariant spectrum, and then the uh, Bec because the I know people have considered this model in other uh, you know aspects, and usually if you have uh, more than two extra dimensions, ah. then th there would be problems observationally. So I don't know with with neutrino emissions yes, from supernova. People have considered higher dimension, but you know that is why. Uh, okay, we had actually come across some papers with the higher dimension thing. That's why we had in put this Gauss uh, bonnet, the, like, no. including the Gauss including bonnet. The, okay. You know, in the ADD model, uh, Arkani, Hamed, Dimopoulos, Devali. If you look ah. at them, they they put that extra dimensions, and the constraint was they cannot go beyond two extra dimensions. 
Um, you may the, want. You know, where is the constraint coming from? I mean, with the, with the neutrinos coming from supernovae. So. Oh, I see. So you may want to look at that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. No, 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 it's, ex oh, yeah, sorry, the extra dimensions are compactified. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's what I was saying that uh, there are some cases where it is, ex uh, where it is growing, but that's why I said that this is something which we have, we have, we have tried to sort of uh, arrest it, so which we have not been able to. Yeah, it is compact. Okay. It is compact. Okay, I think we should move on. So let's thank Sesh again. <laughs> Next, we have Sriram.